Yeah, my name's Cody Horby. I'm the owner of UpToCode. So I started my apprenticeship in 2003, became a journeyman carpenter in uh, May of 07, and that's the same time I started my business. So at the beginning, it was just me and my brother. We were building decks and doing the things that carpenters do. And then in 2008, we took an ICF course, and right from that point on, we knew that that was going to be kind of a leading edge thing. And not that it's crazy technical, but just offers so many uh, benefits to the industry. And then I started a YouTube channel in 2012, just trying to do the DIY thing and put out some useful information. And I still do lots of videos and actually plan on doing more and more as we go here. And I'm actually recording this just for my own personal use. Um, I am going to put this slideshow and make a video out of it. It's so all the same information, the same title. And uh, yeah, so we'll, that, you'll follow that at the end too. But it'll be on YouTube, so if you guys need a refresher, need to see some of the photos, just uh, find it on YouTube. So there it is there. Um, okay, so we'll just start with the background information on ICF. Um, we won't go deep into everything. I just want to give you guys an idea of just things to look for, different applications, windows, things like that. I, I have some blocks here, so if you guys, if anyone wants to just come and snag a block just to look at, touch, feel, just feel free, pass it around. Um, and same with questions. If you have questions as we go, just, yeah, feel free to, to ask away. So really, there's multiple types of block companies. There's, I don't even know how many, six or eight different block manufacturers. But at the end of the day, we're not going to go through which separates one, one company from the next. At the end of the day, it really just sums up to three basic com components is the foam itself, the ties, and then the concrete. Other than that, what separates one company from the other is maybe size or just different small characteristics. But yeah, we're not going to get into that. So to start with the foam, the foam is your insulation value, but it also just, it stays in place and that's your formwork. So you don't have to set up a bunch of plywood forms and then pour your concrete and then strip it all down. So it's kind of a beauty system where it's all built in. You just stack it. You don't need as much equipment. And yeah, so the foam acts as the insulation and the formwork. It's your vapor barrier as well. And uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. And then the ties, so the ties are there. They hold the force of the concrete while you're pouring, the, while you're making a pour. And it also has placement for rebar, so you can place rebar. Um, essentially, every row of block gets a row of rebar. And then they're staggered, like you stagger one row to the other, and then you just later on, I don't really have a good picture of it, but you just drop your vertical rebar down once everything's stacked and then that way the vertical rebar can actually fall and push up against the foam and become useless it it falls in between it just all depends on how you stagger the horizontal rebar and yeah the the ties are there because often people ask me like how do you how do you attach to like a foam house it's kind of useless but those same ties they sit about a half an inch below the surface of the foam and you can screw to it, nail to it, and all that. So depending on the block, they all have specs on, okay, this tie will hold this much pressure on a nail and has all the tensile. Like every block company has done tons of research. So if you need to know like how much a nail would hold in a, in a tie, you can do that. But really the ties are there for multiple reasons, but they're there so you can easily attach siding or st stucco or anything to the exterior plywood or drywall to the interior. So you can see, you can just, because it's a vapor barrier too, it's over two and a half inches thick of foam. You don't, you don't need to poly. You literally just screw the drywall right to the foam. And what I learned the other day, which just doing a bunch of other research and I asked a uh, building envelope specialist and he said, concrete's actually a vapor barrier after two inches. Because yeah, on another topic, we are, I was, had some technical questions. And then the concrete. So the concrete, after you stack all your block and you're ready to pour, the concrete is the structural component. It's eight times stronger than a wood frame. And it allows for any design possible. So you see the top right corner there, you see that the big gable end there and that rake wall. 
that's freestanding. There's no bracing there. I don't need a roof to hold that gable end up. And I can create all sorts of unique uh, design elements and I don't lose the insulation value because the foam is a continuous insulation inside and out. In even those other two photos, you can see we've done the pour, we've stripped it down and the walls just stand on their own. We don't need a roof to hold it up. So they're disaster resistant and all that. Uh, the concrete adds thermal mass. That comes into more technical energy efficiency stuff. They don't really, when somebody calculates our value, they don't, thermal mass is never part of the equation, but so that's why when people ask you like, what's the R value of a ICF, you can say, well, technically on paper, it's an R24, but it acts like an R50 because of the thermal mass component and the concrete just slows if, if your winter conditions, it just slows the cold coming through the wall or even in the summer, just that sun blazing on the side of your house, the concrete slows that heat coming through. So you don't actually feel that right away. Whereas like a two by six wall, I think it's 20 minutes before you can feel the heat from the sun come through. So I'll get into a little bit more of that later, but yeah, the basement we pour just a little bit higher than the main floor. Then we set up, we do our, we do our joist system in our subfloor. Then we set up and do another pour. So in that scenario, yeah, we would have poured about 10, we tried to do about 10 foot lifts at a time. That's what our bracing handles. And then that, yeah, that gable end we did individually. But you have your rebar always comes through and you have a dowel. So the dowel system, you always stick two feet up out of an old pour so it ties into the new pour so you don't ever lose strength there. I'll get into cold joints and stuff later. So yeah, really all an ICF is, is you just stack it, you brace it and you pour it. So yeah, like I just wanted to give you guys enough pictures and background information just so you know, okay, if you come across an ICF, just hopefully some of these pictures and images will help you diagnose or just so you know what, to, what the bones of the structure looks like in behind the finishes. So I think the biggest thing for the block is just to know the common widths. Typically what you'll fall into, I've, the two types of block I use is either a, for a six inch course, you have a six inch concrete center and the wall thickness is either 11 and a quarter or 11 and three quarter and that's foam to foam. And that, and typically if you want to figure out if it's an ICF house or a basement, you can just diagnose like either through a, a door opening, just open the door and try to calculate the jam width or a window. We'll get into windows too. Um, so if you have an eight inch concrete core, then you're rel basically a 13 and a quarter to 13 and a half inch foam to foam wall thickness. Yeah, so like I said, the concrete ties are typically eight inch on centers. Um, I, we're not gonna get into the length or height of each block because it's kind of irrelevant. You can cut and make any basement height or any length. So it, there's no telltale sign to say, oh, okay, I know it's an ICF because it's eight foot four and they're so weird. They they're always have funny heights, doesn't matter. You can, we adjust the heights. And when we build a place, well, recently we've been doing, like we just try to maintain like an eight foot one or a nine foot one and sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, because concrete is roughly 5,000 pounds per cubic meter. Just recently we poured, we did a 50 meter pour. So we had 250,000 pounds of concrete that got poured. So you can see how things go sideways if you're not prepared or you're not knowledgeable in that. You gotta have res healthy respect for concrete. And it's scary because when you're standing on the wall, you can feel it jiggling and moving. And it is just, it's kind of gives you a strange feeling because you're standing on the top of it all. And you know, we brace, we, we always over brace, but it just has that weird feeling. Yeah, and as you can see, like this photo just shows how straight the wall real, really is. And that's just, you gotta prepare. We pre-run pre all your string lines, so that after you pour, if it's a hot summer day, you don't have much time before the concrete sets. So you wanna just get your walls string lined. And if you look, all those braces, they're all turnbuckles. So it, the, the bracing obviously holds the walls up, gives you a platform to walk on, but also has turnbuckles to straighten it. So it's all, it's just a beauty, beauty system, all built in. And yeah, one thing to point out for you guys, uh, if you had a full ICF house, the walls, if you do it right, the walls are straight and once they're set, they'll never move again. 
on like a wood frame, you know how you always get the caulking that cracks along the backsplash? You won't get that in an ICF because we're not, our walls aren't high humidity. We're not changing with the humidity or the temperature. It's just set in stone, really. Okay, so a lot of people wonder how you do electrical in an ICF and it's just, it's relatively easy. You either just run electric chainsaw. Some guys will put like a bolt through it so it just has a guide so you don't go too deep. Uh, you can chainsaw really horizontally, vertically. And then when on an interior wall, we just have a wood frame, like standard, like conventional. And you just drill a hole through the last stud and wrap it through and it's pretty easy. So you just create that groove and uh, yeah, stuff the wire in and away you go. And some guys hot wire it, but it's, it's all the same. You just create a gap, push the wire in, and then you just foam the gap afterwards and away you go. So you can see just a couple photos there. You just notch it in. Um, I'm not exactly sure, like some, they have specialty boxes that just have like these little prongs that st stick out and grab the foam. But the drywall kind of holds it too. But yeah, I've never had an issue with boxes coming out or coming loose as long as you're yeah, even our electrician, he doesn't charge any charge us anymore to do a, an ICF install. It's it's easy. Okay, so for plumbing, I couldn't really find any good plumbing photos. A lot of the time, you don't really you don't have to do like big vent stacks in an ICF. Most of the time, when we're doing anything, it's just a, a vent for a sink, and then the water lines or the drain lines for the sink, we just come up through the floor because it's all in the cabinets anyway. So you can see where we, the tuck tape line there, that's the vent, the vent stack for the sink there in the kitchen. And this, like I said, the pictures aren't very good, but you can see just the, the red tuck tape there is the venting for the, the vanity and the master. Right, yeah, and the foam on an ICF is roughly two and a half inches thick, two and a half, two and five eighths, so you can you can fit the vent pipes in there easily and it's not a big deal. Yeah, I pulled these off the internet, but yeah, on the right there, we've never had to do anything that crazy, but you, you can, you just, just more work to do. But yeah, typically it's just that, the one little vent stack for, for a sink. On the left, we've, we've ran into the odd situation where you have to run water lines. Like if, if you have a basement bar and you forget to run the water lines like before you pour your slab, We've run it from the joists down. And then what we do is we just keep it right flush with the backside of the drywall. And then we always air test our line. So if a drywaller does hit it with a screw. Yeah, so it's not ideal, but I don't think you're ever gonna get frozen water lines. But yeah, I try to prevent stuff like that from happening, but I don't think it's a big deal as long as you don't bury the water lines right back to the concrete itself. But I don't think it'd ever get cold enough, it's, but you know, try not to do that. Yeah, and a lot of people wonder how you attach the, the drywall and siding, and like I said, those snap ties are every eight inches, so really, in all, in all reality, you have twice as many studs, let's call them, than you would in a wood frame. And once you find one, it, it, unless the guy just did a butcher job, you should just be eight inch centers from there. And there's one block company that has six inch centers, so I might throw you off too. And they're in a mechanical room. You can see that we, it's easy to plywood. Now, because it's a, a mechanical room and we have the open joist ends, you either have to drywall or plywood those because you're not technically allowed to have o open foam on a finished house. So you just got to cover it up. So we just cut individual pieces and put it in the joist ends and cover the foam. Yeah, and I've had people ask me like, do you need to frame frost walls or additional walls to be able to attach stuff to and as you already know it's it's a no. Uh, some people think the cabinetry is super hard to to install but like I said it's, it's the ties are every eight inches you have twice as many attachment points you can still use anchors if you want and uh, I've had some people I've never seen it done but you can actually router out a half inch depth because you have a half inch fo foam over top of your ties you can router out a half an inch put in half inch plywood and then mount your cabinets, but I think it's kind of redundant. And you don't, you don't need a vapor barrier. So like I said before, you just throw your drywall right onto it. Okay, this is probably the one that when I first started doing ICF kind of threw me off the most is there's so many people out there that 
because you have those the two and a half inches of foam on the outside they say oh you don't need building paper because you technically have an air barrier but every single seam of block can if you have water coming into your building if you don't paper it or don't flash it you're gonna have problems so that's probably one of the major points that I want to drive home is yeah the the paper is yes I actually don't know to be honest because I've, I've never actually read that part of the code because that's that's why there's that misinformation because everyone's like well it has an air barrier so you don't need the paper what people don't understand and we could get into this I might as well do it right now is the building envelope which I'm learning more and more and doing more homework on is kind of a missing link or a gray area. And it's your building paper in my mind, and I, I think people are slowly coming onto it, is the, the building paper is your drainage plane, right? So many, and even I thought this when I first started like 10 years ago, I was like, oh, it's, you just, everyone knows you need building paper, but they don't really know why. And they don't know that it has to be shingled and to be able to shed water and it's your drainage plane. So for stucco is a huge problem and whether it's acrylic stucco or conventional and it's just because everyone's worried about installing the stucco but no one's actually thinking about how it's gonna drain water below the stucco. So on an ICF, it is scary because I, I don't know if it's an actual code because people technically you don't need to paper it because it'll never rot but you know, water will, water will pass through, especially on stucco, yeah. for sure. Because it's, the, it's, everyone thinks, oh, it's two and a half inches of foam, water can't get through it, but it can, because all the little joints, they can just travel wherever, you guys know what water does, it can get in the weirdest positions and get in anywhere. Right. Right, that's true too. Yeah, you have a good point. So I, I'm obviously like, yeah, I'm OCD. I don't, I'm like a lot of people, I don't want to get the call back. When I build a place, it's like, okay, that was great doing work, but you know, unless you're gonna invite me over for a beer and I don't want a call from you, <laughs> right? And I'll come and hang out with you later and watch the game, but yeah, definitely don't want to be fixing problems, so. Now, one thing that I don't know, this is just a building envelope thing is a lot of guys, because there's so many new products out all the time that even on a wood frame, guys are throwing a lot of peel and stick at things. But the thing, if you punch a bunch of holes in peel and stick, even on a wood frame, if water gets through it, it can't get back out now because it's a seal, right? And so there's a guy that I that I starting to learn from, and I've done some work with him. His his name is Daryl Paul from Qualistat. I'll, you'll see some of his images on here, and he's a if you need anyone that's a guru on building envelope, yeah, it's Qualistat, his name's Daryl Paul. And that's, that's who I'm starting to learn from more. Yeah, just try to look for evidence of flashing or building paper, anything to make sure that it's done properly. So even a deck ledger, like on the very right there, that was one I did about three or four years ago. I'm actually kind of changed the way I do the flashings of the deck ledger. Like that one I did peel and stick because there is just so many penetrations in behind there that water's bound to get in. But you can, like if you look closely, I have the drip cap on the underside of the ledger and then one on the top side, which is apparently the proper way. Um, yeah, and then just the photos on the left there of the windows. You can see the very left photo has the, you can see the, like you have to do your paper and your peel and stick beforehand, but like unfortunately you guys will probably never see this. Um, but it has to be done properly. Uh, so you do, you do your, the bottom sill first, install the window, do the sides. Yeah, so we'll just talk about anything that's below grade and then we'll kind of work our way up the house here. So like ICF is essentially the same as conventional concrete, you just have the foam on each side, but they both just sit on top of a footing. Um, so when you're inspecting, we use tons of rebar, but at the end of the day, like how does anyone know if you have rebar connecting your footing to your wall? Stuff like that, right? Yeah. And so we talked about peel and stick on ICF. 
I don't see why anyone wouldn't have a peel and stick on there, but the peel and stick's supposed to run down the wall and wrap around the footing, and that'll prevent water from getting in between that coal joint with the bottom of the wall and the top of the footing. But other than that, like the weeping tile system's the same, all that. But what I think, like if, if you have a place that has an ICF basement, I, I, I think personally you have less likely of a chance of water getting through the actual wall itself because like conventional is just kind of a roll on tar. But if anything shifts or cracks, that tar isn't thick enough to actually be pliable. It's, if, the, if the foundation cracks, the water's getting in. Whereas on an ICF, that membrane is pliable and durable. Yep. You also use like a dimpled membrane like the Delta Yeah, I have, yeah. So if I use a dimpled membrane, I'll go right over top of the ICF. We just did one here. We had a 10 foot backfill and I wanted the dimpled membrane just because uh, yeah, you guys probably know, but if you have like a high clay content, you get hydrostatic pressure and it'll force the water into the house because it's the path of least resistance. So the dimpled membrane just acts as that drainage plane to get the water down to your weeping tile system. So yeah, yeah. So the dimpled membrane would go over top of the peel and stick or the blue skin. And I just fasten it right at the top. I don't go crazy. I know you can fasten it anywhere on conventional, but yeah, I just try to maintain as minimal amount of fastener so it doesn't rip off. Yeah, we've seen that with the peel and stick too. We always throw a one by four on at the very top of the peel and stick and then we just do our work and as it settles, it will pull it down a little bit, but at least it doesn't totally just yank it loose. Plus peel and stick doesn't peel away from the wall, but yeah, you'll have that, those issues too. And you just gotta be aware of it. And it is important to check those items to make sure that it isn't tearing down or you don't have water coming in through the backside. But I still think the, yeah, as long as water isn't getting behind the peel and stick, then you, sh you should have less likely of a chance that you'll have water coming through the wall. Because if, if guys are doing the ICF the way it, the system's designed, there's way more rebar than conventional. And uh, so that even, your concrete will always crack, but at least it can't open up or shift and create a, a spot for water to get through. So um, when you're looking for issues or clues is if there's water damage, you wanna just look near the bottom of the wall, use your moisture meter because if there's a high water table or anything like that, it'll just end up soaking the footings and that water can wick up the concrete wall and then create issues that way. So, and unfortunately I don't really know, never done a home inspection like you guys do. So I don't know what exactly info you need, but I'm kind of, a lot of this comes down to is it isn't, there is the differences between conventional, but I don't think it's drastic enough that it just blows your mind or you can't figure it out. I think, common sense will rule and you just got to think about yeah the basic physics so yeah there's a cross section of the footing material so on the left there's conventional and on the right is an icf cross section so the bottom of the foundation to the footing relatively the same um, the conventional you can see that the, the the concrete slab itself sits on top of the footing whereas in an icf Typically now with all the energy codes is you have the foam that sits on top of the footing and then the slab. But at the end of the day, it's all this, it's still the same connection. If you're going to have, if you have a high water table, it's still going to just shoot through that, through that connection there. Uh, and then like, this is just me propaganda for ICF, but you have a, you, your insulation ties into the wall insulation. You have a con continuous building envelope with ICF and that the below grade insulation, whereas no matter how well you insulate a conventional, you always have a, your frost wall sitting on top of the slab and there's no actual way to make a true connection from your wall insulation to the under slab insulation on conventional. Yeah, so I already talked about that. It's just, yeah, that under the slab insulation touching the wall and creating that constant loop of insulation. Okay, so how do you know if there's a void in an ICF? And whether you're talking ICF or conventional, it's still a, an issue for you guys is, how do you know if it's done properly? It's the house is typically finished. It's gonna be hard to tell one way or another if there's enough rebar and all that. Um, but it, to, to figure out if you have a void, like I would assume most of you guys have the infrared cameras that might give you a clue, but like I said, on 
That's Daryl Paul from Qualistat there helping me diagnose some stuff. What he does is kind of unique and I, 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 no one would expect you guys to do this, but if you need someone more technical, what he does is he installs a blower door. Like he does a blower door test, creates that negative air pressure. Then, well, what he does, well, he does a benchmark with the infrared first, then creates the negative air and then goes around with the infrared later. And you, if you had a void, then you would see it because you'd see the air gushing into the, the building. Because then you have your bringing in cold air or, and then you can, you can see that temperature differential. Okay, so we're going to talk about just an ICF basement and conventional framing above and what that, that connection would look like. Typically, you're going to either put an LBL or a 2x10 or 2x12 on top of the ICF wall. You can kind of see it there. That's old school joists, of course, but it's all relatively the same. You, you have a basement and you sit your floor on top and then you sit your walls on top of that. So this is a picture of what how we install a top plate like we do basically PL premium and acoustical at that connection because the sill gasket's never thick enough and won't stop the air from coming in so that's what we do I don't I highly doubt anyone else does that but that is a spot that could get air infiltration on most but yeah it's just a, a LVL on top of the wall and then the joists sit on top of that so I, I wanted to just throw some infrared images in here so you guys, if you, if you are looking at an ICF house, just gives you some clues on what to look for. Um, this is technically an actual shot from a, a ceiling to a truss, but it would be the same if you had an ICF basement to a floor. You would see that dark line where the, that top plate is. Okay, so yeah, window bucks, we'll get into that right now. Uh, you'll see there's multiple, multiple types of window bucks, but like I still use the wood one. I like it, it's tried and true, they're strong. They, it gives you nice attachment for your windows. You have something nice and solid to nail to. It gives you something to, to mount your trim to on the inside too. So just, there's so many nice elements about just a wood window buck. But same thing is if, if nobody does the building paper or anything properly, you can get water infiltration either obviously through the window opening itself or the LVL in the concrete. I'd figure that's probably less likely. We do put a, a sill gasket in there and, and we porcupine it with nails or screws just to tie the buck into the, to the concrete itself and then the buck can't actually go anywhere. Well, I actually never put vinyl siding on ICF, but... <laughs> no, if, if you're going vinyl siding like right up to the window, you'll have that, that either an inch and a quarter, inch and three quarter of the window buck. So if you have a J trim, you can just, you probably just nail through the window flange and hit the, the buck itself. If you're putting on, let's say you're putting on smart trim, like we've done a few with Hardy and stuff like that. And it, it gets a little tricky. Um, we just put the smart trim on. And like I said, you'll, because the ties are every eight inches, you're not that far away to a connector. So like with Hardy, if you're four or six inches away, not a big deal, but Final siding, I could see if you're doing smart trim around the windows, how do you mount your J trim to your, but you could technically staple or fasten the J trim through the side into the, the smart trim itself. I threw this on in here, it's just so you guys are aware, like if you're looking with an infrared camera, you might not see if they have a foam buck, but you definitely see if they have an LBL buck in there. So here's an image too, you can, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see the LBL wood buck around the window. So just something to give you a clue later on. And you can, you can see the LBL at the top there too. Now this one, we didn't have any attic insulation. So just so you're aware. And yeah, we already talked about just prepping the window, but just not that you guys would be able to see it, but at the end of the day, if it's not papered, you're more likely the, to get some water ingress through the openings. Yeah, so this, this place we're just finishing right now, we did uh, engineered wood siding, and it, it's not too bad because we always have something to anchor our smart trim to, and then we're never really more than four inches away when we're attaching the siding, so it, it works well for that. We, don't, we didn't have to strap the building out. But at the end of the day, you still have all your paper on there, and you still have to lap your paper just like a shingled roof so that water can run down that drainage plane and, and out of your drip caps. So different window styles. I still like just the, the good old um, 
flange style window mounted just flush to the exterior and we just do a jam extension. So this is a ply gem. They, they've really come a long way. They've, they're a really nice window for everything's taped off on the inside and they've, they've stuck to the code and stayed ahead of it. Um, yeah, so really it's the same as conventional construction, just a bigger jam. Now this, this house we did is an all weather window and they do have one where it mounts the same. It's a flange mount flush to the outside, but they set their glass back about two or two and a half inches. So you can, you, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see that the, the glass is set back and the sills tapered a bit. So yeah, so deck ledgers and that, we already talked about that. This is my little drawing I did for my guys a little while ago. I was showing them the new way that we're gonna start papering. So uh, like I said, I'll have it on the YouTube video so you have a, you can analyze it if you're really hungry for info, but just, yeah. Just because it's an ICF doesn't mean that you don't have to do all this stuff. The one advantage that we have is the building isn't gonna rot. Same with penetrations. Really when you're doing all, our, all of our penetrations are, are sleeve in the wall. So we have to think ahead, sleeve the openings but that's a point where water could come in because a lot of times you just have a small gap and you spray foam it. So if, you, if there's no detail around your penetrations, it's the same as a wood frame, the water is still gonna find its way in. Okay, so if you have a full ICF house to the trusses, then we'll get into the, how to hang the floors and such. Essentially the walls run up way past the floor system so you don't get an interruption of your wall system and you actually don't lose R value or anything. You have that continuous insulation just run right up to the trusses. And then the floors just hang from the ICF wall. And there's two ways to do that. You have a Levan hanger system or you have the Simpson system. So here's some Levan hangers. Like I said, you, when you're pouring a full ICF house, you just pour a little bit higher. You pour higher than your floor joists. Uh, Here's one here, like you can see the bottom two photos there are the Levan hangers. So you just insert those into the foam, stick the rebar through, there's little holes there at the back. You, you rebar those in, you cast them in place, you pour a little bit higher than the hangers themselves and then you just, once you're done, you strip all your formwork down and you install your floor system, do your subfloor and then just move on to the upper floor and start stacking block and bracing again. So here's another infrared image of what it would look like. So if you guys come across a full ICF house, this is in the Levan hanger system. And you, there is some cold transfer through the hangers because they're embedded into the concrete and they're steel. So they're gonna just transfer some, there'll be a temperature differential there for sure. And then the Simpson hanger system is a little more involved. There's a lot more steps to it. The, the one advantage to a Simpson hanger system is that if you have some awkward settling and some of your hangers don't, aren't perfectly straight, you don't have to shim your joists. You just, cause this LVL gets put on later. So with the Simpson, they have a connector that goes and gets mounted to the, to the foam and into the concrete with the rebar through it. And it's, so it's cast in place, but it just sits flush with the foam. Then you do your pour and then you come back later and you run the LVL on top of that. And there's like a J style looking hanger. So that hooks either a two by 10 or a two by 12 or a LVL. And then you have to screw through that hanger, through the LVL and through your first hanger. So it's, it's a tremendous amount of labor and it's hard on tools. But like I said, the advantage to that is you can get a perfect laser line uh, shot in with the floor if something funny happens. But we've done lots of Levan systems and it's, it's just way easier, it takes literally a few extra minutes of forethought and you won't get any settling really. The whole building settles as a whole, but you don't, what one hanger doesn't go off, off of anything else, as long as you have that ledger and you mount them to it. So you can see here, um, the foam is still continuous in behind the ledger. So if you guys are looking for clues or something later, you won't, I don't think you'll see that LVL ledger in a infrared image you might because of there will be screws fastening through you might see some some imagery there but if you look at the back of the wall that's what it looks like this is actually this is the joist system was crazy on this when we did a circular set of stairs in this house but what i want to talk about here is just that cold joint that we're 
we referred to earlier. Like I said, you got to stop the concrete somewhere and then move again. So you have a cold joint there. So that's where it's important to have your building flash properly. Because if you have water infiltration from above, it can run down the foam and it's not going to hurt anything if you have water sitting in there. But it, if there is a cold joint, it will come down and then if it can wick in through the cold joint and into the house. So if, if that is happening, you'll see moisture either on the ceiling of the basement or in that joy space somewhere or right at the top of the very, the basement wall. Yeah, you can see here the picture on the left is a cold joint where it's actually like it's troweled out. That's where our door buck's going to sit or our door. So we seal that down to the concrete, but then in behind there inside the wall is that cold joint. And yeah, if you're OCD like us and we always make sure that guys aren't cutting the foam inside the wall before you pour, like we always just make sure to keep the walls nice and clean. Yeah, so when the connection at the trusses is the same as the connection if you were just doing a standalone basement, instead of a ledger at the basement height, the ICF just goes up to the trusses and you do the same anchor bolts and LVL at the top. I like, I like to do an LVL just because it doesn't cup or twist or, you know, if, if a two by 10 cracks, right down the middle, then you're losing a lot of your strength. The LVL won't do that and it doesn't cup. Well, I guess it cups if there's water, a lot of water damage. So that's what the top of a wall looks like for, and ready to set trusses on. You can just see the nice LVL all the way around. But at the end of the day, if you guys are inspecting, it's essentially the same as conventional. Truss sits on top of it. You still need your insulation stops done properly. Um, what we've been doing, we can, you can actually buy a 44 inch long insulation stop because you're building high efficient homes. You want a nice tall heel height. So you can see there a regular 24, you'd get that wind swirling again. So we extend the insulation stops further up the roof because we've seen it, like I bet you an eight foot diameter hole in the insulation because we're up uh, way up on a hill facing west and a just strong wind came in before soffit and just yeah, eight foot diameter hole in the insulation. So we're like, why is it, why is it dripping from the ceiling? And it was just condensating. So yeah, it is important to make sure all the insulation stops are done properly. But at the end of the day, it's not really any different than you guys. Will, it's, it doesn't really change your game a whole lot. That's soffits as well. We, we like to run the paper beforehand. We, we like to put a ledger on. I don't think I'd ever trust. We get a lot of high winds recently, especially in the last few years, that I would never trust putting a J-trim, even if you screwed every eight inches into the ties. Yeah, I always just run a ledger, and that should be done. I think that's a good common practice, or maybe or just a good practice to do, even if it is a wood frame, because that J-trim for your soffit can just fold upwards and then pop your soffit up into the, into the truss space. So yeah, just always have your paper, and then later when we when we go to side, we can just tuck underneath that and watershed properly, and then there's no dramas. And you can kind of see there on the corner, the soffit gets installed and away you go. And on this one, because we weren't gonna side for a while, you can see just the little OSB strips. Those are there just so that our paper doesn't get torn off in a high wind. So a vapor barrier on, an, on a full ICF is the same as conventional. We just don't have to run it down the walls. But you can see we acoustical right to the, that top LVL and we, we rate on the wood itself and then rate on the gap between the bottom of the wood and the top of the foam. And then my brother did this place, he went crazy and taped it to the wall too. And most, most of that's for when the guys are boarding, they don't catch a flap of the poly and rip it off. So most of the, the tape's just there to, for the drywallers. And yeah, this is, if you look at the imagery there, that's from Qualistat as well. And that was the one that we had where there's no insulation in the attic yet. And you can see the top left image, you can see some air, a little bit of air coming in because it was on, the building was on negative air. But just so you guys are aware, just to know what you're looking at if you're running the infrared. And the bottom left there is, yeah, there's no insulation. So you can see all the girder trusses and stuff. Yeah, so I don't think there's any like big smoking guns for the presentation here. Like, I think most of the, the information I want to provide is just to give you guys an idea of familiarize yourself with the imagery, know how they're built and put together. So that kind of just helps you later on when you run into to a situation or a house that's built like that. 
And like I said, I'll have a YouTube video and it'll be called Clues for Inspecting a Finished ICF House. And I'll have all the same imagery from here. And yeah. So I think the key points, oh, don't let me forget, I gotta talk about HVAC. Um, basically how to figure out if it's an ICF. One idea is just bang on the wall. Just hit it with your hand. You'll know because it feels like you glued drywall to a cinder block. You know, it's solid. So you, you can tell the difference between that and a stud wall any day. Um, the wall thickness will give you guys some clues as to what to look for. I, like I said before, I don't think the basements are less likely to leak, I think. But if you do have water issues, check the bottom of the walls. Just probably a typical practice for you guys. Yeah, and I think the biggest key point is try to see if there's some building paper and, or at least flashings, you know, verify that there is because that could be a major issue down the road. And like, yeah, we talked about it's that gray area. The, is it code or not? Yeah. One of the biggest common problems I've seen with these homes is how to finish from ground level to the first floor on the outside. Like I've seen Kay. people put uh, screw mesh wire on right. for stucco and yep. that can break. Uh, I've seen people put screw plywood on and then put stucco and that can fall off. Right. Right, I've seen that. So what's, your, what's your preferred method for finishing that gap between the ground and the first floor? Yeah, finishing, I, yeah, that bottom, I still parge it because then it, I don't like when the siding, you can't, I don't think it's probably not a good practice from the siding right down to grade anyway, so we always just parge it. But instead of using like, instead of using stucco mesh, you have to use a diamond lath like for stonework. And in my experience, we just mount that, like we actually have a wafer screw, like a large head screw, and you just screw it to the webs. Normally we do the prep work ourselves, we'll install the mesh, because the guy, I don't know why, the guy just blows their mind that it's ICF and they can't find attachment, but you try to mark it and you try to say it's eight inch centers, like here's your first mark, but for whatever reason it's tricky, but. So we install the mesh, screw it on, and as long as the guys do like a good scratch and brown coat, like if it's on heavy enough, we've never had any issues, but I could see where that's it. Most of the time what happens is, is you parge it and then it, the grade settles and then you see the blue skin, right? So like, and that's just building practice. We always, I always keep the grade low, do my parging and then finish the backfill, but that's just. And that goes right over the blue skin. Yeah. And I like screwing through the blue skin because at least it's a little bit self-sealing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if there's a better way to do it, I'd probably do it. <laughs> you never put plywood on and then screw No, no. Work. Yeah, yeah, it'd have to be treated plywood and it could be an issue. Yeah. But what I, what I like to do is I like to run the blue skin up in behind my, the bottom, like drip cap for my siding and then I put the, the drip cap on and then I put all my paper over top of that so that all the water from above runs off of the drip caps, which is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they ha it has to be, doesn't matter if the building is ICF or wood, it still has to be papered and flashed. So the, the diamond mesh you use, is, is it galvanized? Yeah, yeah, same as what the stone, stone guys use. Oh yeah. After about 30 years, it doesn't seem to, because it's exposed, because it's behind the parking, right? I wonder if that's from when guys, when they, you've probably seen a lot where they finish the siding with just a J or whatever, there's no drip cap. So then the water just actually wicks back in and Could gets be. in behind there and rusts it out. Drip caps. Yeah. Common yeah, because every horizontal break should have a drip. And a lot, I've seen a lot of guys just put the drip right over top of paper, but I like to have the paper behind and then put the drip and then more paper over top so that if water's above there, it can run out and not all the way down the whole wall, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's, it's hard to, like, how do, you, how do you enforce, you know, like it's a whole bigger question is how to, how to make sure guys are doing it properly, is it? You can send them all to the coast for a couple of years. So yeah. Just fixing crap problems, <laughs> no doubt. But if you guys ever 
yeah, make sure you jot down Qualistat, like source him out if you ever have a play or a situation where you need some more expertise. He's your man, like he's, he's a wealth of knowledge. So yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, yeah, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all those, all those good things, so. We, we pre-sleeve, but yeah, if you have to, we've, there's been times where we've missed it. We just do the cheap route and just hammer drill it out. Okay. We just hammer drill it a bit big and put, push through it and then, yeah. Um, but you can get guys to core it. I know coring is tricky. If I've never actually hired a coring guy because I'm cheap, but <laughs> if it was me, I'd probably mount a piece of plywood to the wall and then have them core through the plywood and the, the foam and the, the concrete, just make it easier for them. But. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Oh, shoot. Awesome.